peer reflections on the day's proceedings. We have Claudia Vargas, mental health peer specialist with the TRLA, which is Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid PAD project. Paul Eisenhower, peer specialist, advocate, voice here with the TRLA PAD project. Rachel Chambers and Tristan Scrimmon from Painted Brain. And our moderator is Peter Blank, university professor and chairman of the Burton Blatt Institute at Syracuse University. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Peter to help guide this important discussion. Thank you, Chris. I hope you all can hear me. And uh, what, a, what a great and interesting day. Talk about uh, all the different pieces of the, of the elephant that were touched. Um, really incredible remarks. I mean, I, I heard uh, people, peers, choice, community, technology, making sure this works. It's an ongoing living project that will be looked at carefully and evaluated both from a social, of course, an individual point of view, as well as from a, um, an economic point of view. And uh, without further ado, because I'm excited to hear what, what these folks have to say, I have the easy job today uh, with our panelists. Um, I really just wanna go around with the first question, maybe start with um, Rochelle. What did you think of what you heard today? Uh, what was exciting to you and um, um, what do you wanna hear more of? Yeah, thank you so much uh, for allowing me to tell you what I heard. So what I really did hear today is a lot more work needs to be done around, around this initiative. I hear that there's more education that's needed among peers, family members, doctors, lawyers, and law enforcement. I hear that more advocacy needs to be done among peer supporters throughout our great state. I hear that we need stakeholder feedback, which is necessary to the success of, of this innovation project or any innovation project there's definitely gonna be feedback needed, particularly because I see this as a social justice movement. Um, at Painted Brain, um, we are dedicated to ensuring inclusive, inclusivity um, in all projects at the beginning of these. So what I'm hearing is that we're um, a call, a need for a call to action for folks to get involved. Um, I'm hearing that peers need to organize, get feedback back to our stakeholders and to our counties so that we can organize and get this done. So I'm hearing a lot of work is needed to be done, but we have all the right people to get it going. Thank you. Well, Rachelle, as always, you get right to the point. And I must say, uh, I liked your comment about this being a social civil rights issue, particularly as we emerge, hopefully soon from the pandemic, and we have a whole new wave of activism and citizen involvement and accountability in the country, uh, PADS and its broader framework, SDM, is really a part of that greater movement towards equality. So very well said. Um, Tristan, I put the same question to you today, uh, just now. Um, what did you hear today? Um, yeah, I heard a lot of things too. I was very happy to be on this call. I'm very honored by the people on this uh, team. Um, I, I agree, uh, peers need to be central in this. I heard that again and again, the importance of choice. You know, I'm from Latin America. I'm an immigrant to this country. I came here as a little kid. And, uh, you know, our family didn't understand the system when they got here. And I think for a lot of people, a lot of immigrant families, you know, um, if they have a loved one who has some psychiatric disability, I think PADS can be this great way to um, let their no choices be known and heard and uh, I heard a lot about that. I heard that there's a lot of different populations. I heard um, that not there's no cookie cutter answer, right? This is not a cookie cutter thing. We need to develop maybe a system, a protocol, a way to train people. Um, I'm very inspired by some of the work that um, Lori is, and her team are doing in Texas. Um, also, you know, uh, really the architect of a lot of this is Ellen Sachs, I mean, who has been out here for decades talking about this and the importance, the need. Um, and, and I heard Ellen highlight some very important points about the importance of choice, the need and, and why choice is important. Um, Jonathan Martinez, I heard him talking about 
Um, you know how you know SDM is really for everyone, not just for disabled people. People do it all the time. All kinds of people, you know, get help in decisions, uh, not just people with disabilities. So we need to remember all of these things and keep them fresh in our mind that these are not uh, static issues. They're dynamic. Uh, we need to be constantly thinking about new populations to outreach to. Um, you know, California is very diverse, so the whole United States is really in a lot of ways. And we cannot um, forget about all our differences and all, and all the things that bring us together. And, 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 you know, each group may have its own niche and that's okay. And, and we need to be agile enough to, to respond to that. I also heard about, um, you know, ways that people could get these pads. How can we get them to them? Uh, and again, I think choice and each individual should decide how their pad is to be used. I don't think pads should be used against someone's will. Or, and if we create a list of pads, I think there should be a way to get off that list if we don't want to be on that list or if we change our pad or I think that, that I heard a lot about that too, the dynamic nature of pads are not static things. So um, uh, those are some of the things I've heard, but I, I could go on and on. Uh, it, it was so cool to, to be part of this discussion. With that, I'll, I'll hand it back. Well said, Tristan, also. You know, I was, I, I, I resonate with so many of the things you say also, not as a downer, but we all come to this, this agenda from different perspectives. I sadly lost a close family member with a psychiatric disability this year to a violent death and she did not have a pad. And we, we tried to work on that, but there are real life and death consequences here that uh, we are talking about today that are so inspiring and, and so important. Claudia, I haven't met you before, but you come very highly recommended from one of the people whose opinion I take very, very carefully, and that's Lori Hallmark. Um, tell us a little bit about what you heard today. We're gonna go around a couple of times, so don't feel like you have to say everything uh, the first time. Yeah, well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here and work with Lori and Paul and just like everybody that is pushing forward pads and people's empowering people through choice. I think like at the end of this uh, symposium, if choice is not a word that you heard, you know, you weren't quite listening. Um, and there really is power to choice. You can't make an informed decision if you don't have the information, if you don't know what your choices are, right? And pads kind of, and pads and working with peers is one of the ways to know what your options may be, or at least open up your brain from the usual thing that you get. You usually hear about the um, limitations that you may have when you get a diagnosis, but you don't usually hear about the options that you have to lead a, a life that is genuine and true to you. And at the same time, I think something that we have to remember and that I heard throughout everyone's presentation is that recovery isn't just, or like a diagnosis is not just about like working on like, hey, you know, like getting to my doctor and taking the right medication and what have you. You're a person that has goals. You're a person that wants to sculpt a life that feels very genuine to yourself. And just because you get a diagnosis doesn't mean that you have to give up wanting to be, go back to school, um, you know, open up your coffee shop. I don't know, work part-time at a nursery, whatever it is. I think it's very important to know that not only are you working on your recovery and doing all the treatment, but you're also working on your life because that's important as well. Well said, Claudia. And, uh, I think choice is the operative word, which of course is a vehicle to human flourishing, as you say, which is what we, we all want at, at our institute, the Burton Blatt Institute. Without being overly scientific, we have received a large grant from the federal government, Health and Human Services, to conduct the first randomized control trials ever, looking at the importance of self-determination. And um, we're very excited about that, but we will never lose focus on the individual, as you all say, and on, on what it means to flourish from an individualized point of view. Paul, you're up next. It's nice to meet you as well. I'm saving Ellen Sachs for last. Paul, you also come very highly recommended from a good source that has whispered in my ear, Miss Hallmark, and uh, welcome. What did you hear today? Well, thank you. I'm very fortunate to be working with Lori. Uh, I, like many people, until I met Lori, did not know about pads. Uh, I, I can tell you that that uh, awareness is important and availability and access is important because 
uh, as as a person who is a person with a lived experience with the mental health system, you know, I am not able to go out and get a lawyer to make a psychiatric advance directive and take look for me. So that they're in legal aid is great, you know, uh, awareness. And, and I tell you, when I was in the hospital, uh, when I got out of the hospital and got control of my life again, the first thing I thought was, how do I keep that from happening again? What do I have to do not to go through this situation again? How do I change this bad situation? So, and, and, and you know that it's, you, you have that intuition, this could come again. What happens? What do I do for next time? How do I change it? And a pad is how you do that. Uh, your pad is your voice. It's your way of saying, hey, you know what? This don't work. Try this. I, I worked at a state psychiatric hospital and the people there, they came up to me and they, they wanted insight. It's like they don't want to restrain people. They don't want to do this stuff to them. I mean, nobody wants to go to job and do that kind of stuff but it's like i told them you need to give them options give give the patient options so you don't have to go through the situation and when you make your pad you create options for the the nurse and the psychiatric staff it's like hey instead of doing that why don't you offer me to go outside and drink a cup of coffee or listen to my headphones or something and change that environment and that's how we create power in our lives by by voicing what works for us and what doesn't. Really well said, Paul. And I hear your themes as well. You're adding another dimension. Of course, you mentioned access and Kieran in her great remarks talked about technology. We now live in a world where we're doing this via Zoom and who knows who's gonna hear this, you know, and what we're saying, but there is an element many of us are working on now and that is the aspect of technology. How do we do it safely, securely, in a usable fashion, and most importantly, so the individual retains control and choice of how that pad is used? And uh, I think your remarks in that regard, Paul, are very illuminating. Now I turn to not illuminating, but luminary, uh, Ellen Sachs, who has really been a role model for me, Ellen, thank you for organizing this symposium. And uh, gosh, I'd like to hear from the MacArthur genius, some genius remarks uh, about what you heard today. <laughs> thank you. So, so my understanding was that I was not gonna be reviewing the day's events, but giving some concluding remarks. But I will, if I, if I uh, mass re review the events, I think they were uh, really, really terrific conversations. Uh, we heard about SDM and the value of self-determination, got an overview of PADS, an overview of PADS nationally. We've heard about the California PAD in a innovation pro project program. Um, so I thought that the day's uh, events went really well. Um, and uh, so we've heard, we listened in particular uh, to peer reflections on the day's proceedings. And I think those thoughts were really, really important and really impactful. Uh, should I just go on with what I was going to say about my conclusion? Well, that's excellent, Alan. I'll come back to you. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but we will want to hear your closing remarks, certainly, and we're all excited to hear that. I'm coming full circle back to Rochelle. I always have a smile, Rochelle, when we're talking because you're always lighting up things that I'm thinking about. Um, well, we've already talked a lot about this today. I know we've We've had many issues raised. What's the positive impact that we're really talking about here that PADS is gonna have on the daily lives of people, not just with psychiatric disabilities or impairments, but everybody? Yeah, I think um, from what I've been hearing, Painted Brain, as we noted, has already been doing some initial listening session and, and talking to peer organizations and leaders and family members and consumers. And quite frankly, most, if not all individuals that I've talked to believe that PADS will be transformative in the lives of individuals with mental health challenges, particularly for communities of color. Many noting like they just didn't have a clue uh, what a PAD could do or how it could be enforced. So I'm standing right now and letting you know that with that we have and this education that we can do 
and provide for peers and individuals with lived experience, I believe that it can be transformative in the life. And we see it um, as demonstrated by Lori, the practicality, the mechanics. So we're not just getting on here and saying that it's gonna be positive. We actually, people can actually see that this can be implemented. We have Claudia uh, and Paul on here that actually are implementing um, these pads. So we're gonna, that we already see that it's positive and it has positive impacts on the lives of others in other states. And I'm just looking forward to seeing what we can do in our great state um, and with the leadership of our peers that have already been doing it in the momentum. So I, it's already a lot, um, there's a lot of hope already around the So uh, we're seeing it and we're ready and we're activated. And I appreciate the space to be able to articulate that and to bring peers together to talk about how we can implement this so that we can see that. May I ask you a question, a follow-up? Rachel, not to put you on the spot, you, you uh, mentioned this earlier as a woman of color and in a state like California that is terrifically diverse, Fresno County is very diverse, Latinx, Hispanic communities and other communities versus Los Angeles. Can you frame this larger, this discussion in this larger reckoning we're having now in the context of race and ethnicity and uh, equity? Yeah, I think that uh, to frame it, I think that it allows for, PADS allows for a space to talk about how we interact with police and how we deal with law enforcement. Those conversations in housing are already coming up and people of color have been shouting out and talking about the disparities that are in, that are happening in the injustices. Um, in LA, we have some of the worst homelessness issues, particularly people of color. Um, these conversations are happening and PADS and, and the expansion of PADS and the implement, implementation in our state allows us to bring these co uh, conversations to the forefront and to put some meat behind it, some force behind it. So framing this in the context of, of race equity, yeah, I believe that it's in alignment um, with uh, what people are asking for, more access, education, understanding of their rights, be heard, you know? So hopefully I answered that. And that's just how I see it um, framed in the context of what's going on right now and how we can, and yeah, how we can yeah. make some change. You more than answered it. We really are talking about a new type of conversation between individual and community, between individual and choice, how to live in society. And Tristan, you also come, I believe, from South America, an immigrant background you mentioned. Bring that perspective in as well, if you would. Yeah, um, you know, California and the US in general has a large population that speaks Spanish. Um, you know, I, I came here not knowing English, I was a little kid. Um, you know, uh, you know, I think some of our uh, folks who are monolingual have extra difficulty communicating what their wishes are going to be. Um, also, this document, this um, advanced directive is in advance, usually, of a, of a crisis. So it helps people plan. It helps people understand, similar to what Rochelle was saying about their rights, about, um, you know, a lot of communities just don't know what is a pad. I mean, so many people don't know what it is. And uh, it was interesting um, to hear that uh, when people do know that they can get help filling out pads, many, many people want to make a pad. You know, it, left to their own devices, if they're just given a stack of paper and said, fill this out, uh, it seems too daunting, too difficult. Uh, but with some help, uh, it, it is possible. And, uh, you know, the things that were outlined in this talk about supported decision making and how people can support each other to make these documents, the importance of peers and people who have been through this system uh, to help. Um, and, and of course, Claudia and Paul, their, their work is basically that, you know, they're like, they're actually doing this exact work and, um, and, uh, and helping those communities. You know, um, it's something that, that is very unique. Um, and, and I don't think there's that many people doing this work right now. There should be many, many more people because like, uh, the need is is very high, um, especially in communities, color, immigrant communities, monolingual communities. Um, it's really important. Well said, Tristan. And of course, issues of poverty and equality, as you've talked about. Claudia, I would put the same question to you about the positive impact on people's lives. But you, you hail from Texas, which has a whole different sort of um, demographic issue in some ways than... Um, 
uh, California does, similar in many ways. Perhaps you can reflect on what you've heard so far about the impact of PADS and what you've seen on people's lives, but also approaching it from this multicultural uh, equality approach. Yeah, uh, thank you, Peter. I think one of the most, the great things about a PAD is that at the end of the day, it's your voice. You know, you can put in it things that matter to you, whether it's like your religion or like things that are very important to you, right? At the same time, Tristan mentioned something that is very important across the board, whether it's in Texas or somewhere else, is that communication aspect, as well as planning in advance. If you plan in advance, you kind of have like a safety network where you are able to know that if, you're, if there are certain warning signs that are coming up, these are the people that you can go to. But then you can also know how to communicate. Like if, say, sometimes family members or specific people in our lives can really like push our buttons, right? And just being able to know how to communicate with them, how to communicate with our doctors, how to advocate for ourselves, not just outside of the pad, but while making the pad. Because when you're making the pad, um, you you know, like if you're working with Paul and I, we're not telling you what to put in your pad. We're just sort of kind of brainstorming with you in a non-judgmental way and allowing you to do that self-advocacy, just really practice what self-advocacy looks like at a small level of just like putting it in your pad and then you can go ahead and implement it. When you're working with your doctor, so you can self-advocate, you know, like, hey, so this medication isn't working for me or maybe working with, the, I need to change my doctor because we've been working for a while and it's just not going anywhere. Uh, that self-advocacy part is so critical and it starts at the pad. You know, Claudia, I mean, each one of your comics is, is so right on. If I may follow up with you, Claudia, oh, I made a couple of notes uh, with regard to the planning issue, but um, of course also this is a cross-generational issue. I think to myself, all the kids uh, who have IEPs, individualized education programs, you know, from special education, all the individuals who are in re-entry from prison and jails or juvenile justice facilities or older adults who are leaving nursing homes. Do you see this as a cross life issue? Because our work shows, and I'm sure it's your reaction as well, choice begets choice. When we make decisions, we make decisions. So why not start this at the youngest ages or at those crucial points where people really need that, that individualized approach. What do you think of that? I definitely agree. So like I actually do have a background in teaching little kids and it just goes back to that, um, having the choices and then what your options are, right? Like I work with a lot of kids that also have like four, five or four plants. And then um, just you being able to like work with them and not judge them and say like, hey, these are your options. Like maybe you're really struggling with reading but maybe we can do this. And they'll start holding you accountable, especially the little kids. And uh, uh, with Paul and Lori and our team, we definitely work with individuals that are about to turn 18. And you know, a lot of the times what happens is that uh, parents really get told that the only option, or at least like in parts of Texas, you get told that, you know, like your, your child's about to turn 18, maybe guardianship's the way to go. Right. And if that's, if you're the parent, I can understand like that's the only option that you're hearing and you wanna make sure your child succeeds, but you're not aware of your options too as a parent, that there are other ways that your child can lead a life. And PADS are definitely um, not a reactionary document. You know, this is for planning ahead. So the earlier that you do it or whenever you wanna do it so that you can start your life um, to start to live a life genuine to you and recovery that looks and feels like yourself, the earlier, the better. So this is a cross life experience. So Paul, now we're, we're continuing to peel away this onion, which is a really fantastic conversation. If I may ask you a question, families, uh, particularly parents and families, I know in my own situation, I'm not getting too personal. Um, it was very difficult for us as family members to work with our loved one work is the wrong word, to come to some sort of understanding before it was too late. This is not parents versus children. It's not families versus individuals. How do we balance, Paul, in your experience, individual rights, families who obviously care about their loved ones? Um, how do you make that work in your experience? Um, I... I... 
believe that that it's about acceptance and about respect. And uh, this person may be your son or your daughter, and uh, they're a little different than you expected, but they're still your son and daughter. And it's all about this uh, respect and acceptance of them. Uh, things may have changed. Uh, you know, if, if uh, this was a, a car accident and you were disabled from a car accident, you would go, well, you know, he got injured in his car, he's got a broken leg and he's got a limp and you'd accept it. But people don't accept that with mental illness. They think, oh, well, we gotta give you a pill and you'll fix it and you'll be back the way it was. Many times you can't come back to where it was. Something happened and something changed and the person is dealing with it in one way or another. And the best thing is to be supportive and understanding, but I would say to support them and respect them. Um, I, I've seen uh, so many people uh, incarcerated simply because, you know, they're, they're, they have this diagnosis and we want them to get help. We want you to get help, so we're gonna call the police, which is uh, probably, they're not the warm and fuzzy ones to be calling if you're having a mental health crisis. And many of them have not done anything. They're just not done anything. So they get charges like trespassing or, yeah. or, uh, or, or and, and if they back off, they're evading, or if they touch the officer, they're uh, assaulting. And, and these are serious charges and, and they end up in a system and it's a mess. And if you had more acceptance for your child who is going through this, and, and try to learn more about what they are going through. Try to focus on what it is the experience and not just the diagnosis. Many times the diagnosis is this label and, and people go, well, I need my bipolar medicine. Well, actually, what is it you're trying to deal with with that medication and then deal with that actual thing instead of throwing a whole yeah. genre of drugs at you. And so well, let me stop you there, Paul. I don't mean to interrupt you because I want to make it through the lightning round one round with everybody, but I build on what everybody says. And Paul, you said acceptance and respect, which of course are crucial foundational pieces of what we're talking about. Rochelle, acceptance, respect. Do you see a day when we can get to that point in California and elsewhere with California leading the way? Oh yeah, this is our great state. We have some of the best minds and innovator. We're uh, innovators in our state. We're diverse. We're willing to work across the aisle, work with law enforcement, work with peers, work with families, uh, bring diverse communities to the table. Um, so I, if anywhere, uh, this is gonna happen here and it's gonna be enforceable and collaborative amongst partners. So I see hope, I see acceptance. Um, because this is, this is the, we're in a movement. This is the new normal. Advocacy, standing up for your rights uh, is on the forefront. So uh, yes, it, it, there's a lot of hope um, and acceptance um, in our future, in our great state. Thank you, Rochelle. Well said. Tristan, acceptance and respect. You see a day when we will move significantly in that direction, or maybe we have? I do. I think that day is, is, is approaching, and I think it's good. Uh, acceptance and respect are fundamental. I think, you know, Paul has a lot of insight when he brings those up. And, and I agree with the comments so far. Claudia, we're back to you, but in particular, Claudia and Paul, because you guys, as Tristan and Rachel do, but you all particularly have devoted your time to really directly work with people to create pads. And, and what is it that you have what do you think that they've really learned from this? I guess, Paul, you, you gave it away already, acceptance, respect, control, choice. Claudia, I, do you want to articulate yeah. that uh, for us? These will be the last two points. Claudia and Paul, I'll give you the final points of the day, and then we'll go to Ellen, I believe, for some closing remarks, and, and perhaps a video I think I'm supposed to introduce as well. Claudia? Yes, so I think, uh, and I'm sure Paul will definitely talk more about this, but I think the respect and the integrity of a, Paul, of, a, of a pad rather, comes from like really connecting with the individual that you're working on a pad with, right? And respecting what they wanna put comes down to like what language they wanna put on their pad. And just, um, you know, when we work, when I have worked on pads, uh, we don't just work on the pad and the work really doesn't just end at the pad. 
uh, we work with this person sometimes long term and there are resources that come up. And so sometimes you just bring up like, hey, you know, like you may be aware of this or not, uh, but there's like this peer group or there's this in your area that sounds kind of like you might be interested in it. And you have to respect the choice um, that people have. If they say like, hey, I'm not interested in that right now, or like, I would not go, would not like to go for that at the moment. Um, it's very important because it tells them that they have a choice. It tells them that they really do have a voice and their voice matters. And you're just not saying that to get over with the pad. Um, Cause we do have a client that when we first started talking to, which is called client X, um, we, Paul and I uh, would talk about groups or specifically Paul would talk about a group and um, the client was like, you know what, like I'm not interested, change this topic and what have you. And later on, um, you know, this person has been in guardianship for a while and has been quite isolated at home. And now um, after talking with Paul and I, and because we respect his choices along the way, he, he's the one that came forward and say, hey, you know, about that group, I would like to do it. You know, my schedule doesn't um, align with it, but I'm gonna try my best. And now he has attended the group and he really enjoys it. And it's moving forward in his life and making choices that uh, will lead to a life that is genuine to, to him. Thank you, Claudia. I must say, uh, uh, every time one of you guys speaks, uh, it's, it's not better than the next, but it's so enlightening. And so thank you for that. Uh, Claudia, I, I, I heard you say, uh, of course, the pad is not an end unto itself. Your work doesn't end with the pads. It really is a life choice situation. Paul, how does that resonate with you and the people you've worked with in Texas? Uh, I do think it, it's uh, the work itself is a process. It, you, you look at where you've been, where you are now, and where you want to go. And the pad encompasses all of that. It encompasses where you've been and then where you're now and how you want to, what you want to keep about now and, and where you want to go with your life. And for many people, it's a process that they, they deal with experiences that they've never had the opportunity to deal with. Uh, you're going to bring up stuff that, that nobody talks about, nobody engages in, and they don't, it's not polite conversation. Nobody wants to discuss this stuff and it comes up in the pad. And people go, wow, you know, and, and they go, how can we deal with this, you know? So it's, it's a process that, that's, and being a peer, having, being a peer, it changes things. So if I was not a peer, people couldn't speak with me. I mean, my, my years of being a peer, I've learned that you actually have to have some kind of credibility before people will trust you. It's like, I'm, I'm not talking to you, you know, and it's like, well, you know, I can give them a diagnosis or a, a certification or whatever. They don't trust you. You actually have to build a rapport and a connection with people where they'll trust you and then work with you, you know. So not everyone is going to want to make a pad or, or want to make one now, but, but the ones who connect with you and then go, yeah, I do trust you. I connect with you. And this is, you know, and then you can put, put their voice in a document that can be respected. So but, are, are you saying, Paul, I think you are, that the PAD process itself, putting aside the external environment for a second, is a growth and learning process that- The PAD process itself, yes. Yeah. It's the whole process of making the PAD. People don't, people, you, you can go to a hospital and come out with 12 medications. You don't know what you've got or what you're for or whatever. But when you do a pad, you put all these down and you're listing it and organizing it and you're knowing the ones you did. Uh, I don't think so. And the ones that, uh, you know, I wouldn't mind to be on that one. It's like you're organizing your life, you know, all the medications you've been through, the treatments you've been through, what worked, what didn't, what you'd like to try, what worked. I'd like that. You know, I didn't do that, but I'd like to do that. These and are have, you, have you seen that. that? Have you seen that learning in the people you've worked with in creating pads? Yeah. Open pads? Yeah, it's it, and the thing about pads is, is you know, um, I work with Claudia, who's 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 much younger than myself, but I I've I've known people for for a long time, and you could be in the mental health system for thirty years, and people don't see you on the radar for a long time, and they think, oh, you know, he's got it all made. 
but you never know what's going to happen to you. You might have some yeah. kind of accident or some kind of chronic health condition, or you might lose your support network or your, your insurance. And then the next thing you know, you're having a mental health crisis and you're in a hospital and nobody knows you and they don't know what your works for you. They, they don't know, you know, I've been doing the same thing and this works for me. They don't know that. And if you're not able to communicate it, they don't know. And they just have ignorance, which becomes neglect. But it's not neglect because you can't communicate it. Your pad communicates for you. It is your voice. You say where, what, where you've been, what's going on with you. And how that's, ex that's excellent, Paul. Thank you. I think I'm going to skip over the cat. The cat wanted to get in at one point, um, but I'm going to skip over the cat and go to uh, where I'm told. Usually I go to where I'm told, but uh, I think I was either supposed to introduce a video or go to Ellen Sachs. Uh, would somebody help me with my directives? The, video, the short video, I think it's about a minute and then, and then we'll have Ellen close the day. Okay, I'm going to give Ellen a, 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 a moment if you want to react to any of these comments, Ellen, or should we just go to the video? Let's go to the video and then I'll talk about my, my talk. Okay, I, I, before we do that, I want to say you guys are amazing. That was really a dynamic and interesting discussion. I feel we could have gone on much longer. I apologize if I cut you off at any point, but it's terrific food for thought. I'd like to introduce the video now, and I'd like to say thank you to the panelists in particular for allowing me to have this dialogue with you today. Thank you. The power of choice is sacred. In the most basic sense, we are a collection of the choices that we make. PADS, or Psychiatric Advanced Directives, is a legal rights document that gives you the ability to outline what kinds of mental and physical health treatments you'd like to receive in the event of an emergency. Whether we're talking about the ability to choose to vote for someone in an election or our right to choose what we want to eat for lunch that day, the power of choice is a basic human function that should be afforded to everyone. PADS gives you the ability to make your choices and decisions known to treatment providers and others who may want to choose for you. PADS differ and vary from state to state, so please familiarize yourself with your local and state laws for more information. Remember, you are your choices, and no one should be able to take away your power to choose. Professor Sachs. Professor Sachs, thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, I want to take a brief moment to thank all the panelists discussing this important issue of SDM and, uh, and PADS. Um, uh, just as an aside on the implementation question with PADS, some years ago I uh, was being interviewed or examined to get some kind of physical health treatment. And the examiner said, do you have uh, an advanced directive or a durable power of attorney? And I said, yes. And she didn't ask what it was or where she could find it or anything else. It was just a formality. Um, so the implementation question is an interesting, is an interesting question. Um, I think the topic for today is very uh, important and very meaningful. Um, as shown, for example, by, you know, there's a legal mental health law organization here in LA called Mental Health Advocacy Services, and they reached out and said, how can we help with this project? You know, can we do some of the interviewing ourselves and, and that kind of thing? And just the, the idea that with our uh, innovation project, more and more counties are saying they want to be part of it. So this is a, a product that I think is gaining some traction and people are quite, quite interested in it. Um, so uh, uh, I, I think we're hopeful that our projects on our uh, projects on SDM and PADS lead to a place where more patients, as I've said, make decisions with their supporters and thus resume being the architects of their own lives. That's just so important. Having had my choice taken away from me, it's, it's very important. So we're gonna keep you posted and hope to have another symposium on these issues, basically discussing our findings. 
I also want to shout out a thanks to the people who have made this event happen. Chris Schneiders, the director of the Sachs Institute, couldn't be a better director, and our events office, in particular, Leila Landers. Thank you, Leila. Um, so thank you again for your, uh, oh, also mention again um, that there will be the Q&A event on Thursday, May 13th, and we hope to see you all at that time. So thanks again for your interest in and support of this work that could really change the landscape of decision making among those with lived experience of mental illness. Again, thank you for coming. <laughs>